This is KSL Sunday Edition with Boyd Matheson. Welcome to Sunday Edition. I am Boyd Matheson. Each Sunday we attempt to divide the rage from the reason, elevate the conversation, connect the dots, and make the news make sense. We have conversations with great thinkers, great leaders, and great people making a difference. We talk politics so we can discuss society, and we explore society so we can discuss principles and the people in America who actually live them. We bring the best and brightest to Utah, and we send the Utah model to our nation's capital and beyond. Well, it seems that our nation is stuck in this age of rage and a season of clear unreason, where the cancer of contempt is undermining our confidence in our country and unraveling not only our trust in the institutions of our constitutional republic, but fraying the fabric of trust we have with each other as neighbors and fellow citizens. Many so-called leaders have resorted to political finger-pointing or finger-wagging, while others have simply shrugged their shoulders saying, it's not my job. Someone who has taken a decidedly different shoulder-squaring direction to driving elevated dialogue and re-enthroning respect for human dignity is our friend Tim Shriver. Tim Shriver is the chairman of Special Olympics International, co-creator of the Dignity Index, and co-founder of Unite. He's a New York Times best-selling author of Fully Alive, Discovering What Matters Most, and co-editor of The Call to Unite, Voices of Hope and Awakening. Tim is also an impact scholar at the University of Utah. And Tim, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. It's always an honor. Well, we've been on this wonderful journey over the last couple of years yes, with the <laughs> Dignity Index. And for our viewers who may not be as familiar, give us the quick backstory on the Dignity Index. Well, the backstory, Boyd, is that just as you said in the opening, we live in a time when people are exhausted. They're starving for an alternative to the political discourse they see most of the time. Most of the time, they see outrage, they see vitriol, they see dehumanization of people on the other side, regardless of which side you're on. So we set out to explore the alternative to contempt. What's the word, the language, the way in which you could speak to someone you disagree with but without the contempt and hatred and dehumanizing language. So we explored the research on this. Uh, we looked at psychology and religion and anthropology and these other things. And we realized there's a continuum from contempt up to dignity. Mm -hmm. Treating somebody as though you and the other person share a common humanity, that's dignity, even when you disagree. Yeah. Treating someone as though they ought to be killed because you disagree, that's contempt. Mm -hmm. But there's a gradient, so we built this scale so you can actually see where you fit <laughs> when you describe someone else. When you say those people are, and then fill in the blank, yeah. they're horrible, or they're misguided, or they deserve a chance to be heard, or they must have ideas that I need to learn more about, you can start to hear a different tone yeah. as you move up the scale. So the Dignity Index was developed here uh, in Utah uh, in collaboration with scholars at the University of Utah, where I'm very proud to, to be an impact I hope it's impactful <laughs> scholarship, but to try to bring the best ideas uh, from these disciplines and from common sense yeah. back into the mainstream of our conversations. Yeah, and I think one of the important things is this is this is not about a group hug and kumbaya moment. This not is at all. the country is always at its best when we are a, com a country of big ideas, open, even roiling debate. Uh, but it's making sure we're looking at someone we disagree with, not as not just wrong, but wrong and evil. Uh, that is the, the real test and where we've really fallen off the ledge, so to speak, especially with social media. So as you look at uh, trying to build this scale and introduce it, uh, you also brought the students into this whole uh, yeah. process. Describe that for us. Well, we, we trained, we, we built the scale, we tested it, we modified it when we found the language that wasn't quite right. Yeah. Our goal was to build something that you could use regardless of your political persuasion. Mm. So if I'm a super conservative person, I could evaluate the speech of President Biden without bias. Or if I was a super liberal person, I could evaluate the speeches of President Trump without bias. Mm -hmm. So that was the goal. Yeah. So then we took it to the students at the University of Utah, undergraduates and graduate students, and we trained them. And then we tested, could they uh, be consistent, whether they were really progressive or really conservative or somewhere in the middle? Would they give mm -hmm. that one piece of speech the same score? And we were very grateful and, and excited that they could. You could use it without being accused of bias. Hey, you're a conservative, that's why you don't like Biden, or vice yeah. versa. So the students came, but they said something to us which shocked us, honestly, and it, we're still trying to understand it. They said 
You know, we like using this index to score politicians, mm. but we use it more for ourselves. Yeah. We call this the mirror effect. The, the index was supposed to, we thought, be used to evaluate. Like I could read a transcript of Boyd Matheson and I could evaluate how you spoke to your guest when you didn't agree with the guest and give you a score or scores. Not you personally, but the, t yeah. but, but the student said, yeah, that's interesting. But you know, I really want to use this with my boyfriend, or I really want to use this when my dad calls me and he's upset, or I really want to use this when I'm talking to my professor right. and I feel humiliated or demeaned and I want to fight back, and, or I really want to use this on my social media. One student said to me in class, they were just learning it for the first time, she said, you know, yesterday I posted that I'm defriending this person because they're, and then she used the political party and then mm -hmm. uh, a swear word. <clears throat> And she said, looking at the index, she saw where she fit. She was, it was a low score. And she said, you know, I'm going to go take that post yeah. down and remove it from my social media feed. That surprised us because what we, what, we were, what we were reassured by is that people are hungry for change. Mm. They don't know how. Yeah. The index gives them a tool yeah. to move up and add more dignity to their speech, and people seem to really enjoy it. Yeah, elevating that dialogue is such a crucial thing. It's one of the things that jumped out to me, that mirror effect early yeah. on was like, okay, I just, yeah, had, a I, just yeah, had a disagreement yeah, with my wife, and I just yeah. realized I blew out the scale. Yeah. This was not a dignified conversation. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but it's so easy, especially in the social media world and 24-7 news cycles, uh, and a lot of performative politics yeah. that actually yeah. plays to those base, contempt-filled yeah. emotions. What are you starting to see now in terms of the changing of the dialogue Dialogue, both on co campus and other places. Well, we're seeing glimmers of interest here. We're starting to see the media cover this story, Sto not the co story of immigration or taxes or policy, but the story of contempt. Mm. Who is using it and who isn't? And they're also starting to cover the story of the fact that we actually agree much more than we realize. Mm. Uh, the vast majority, 60 to 80 percent of Americans, agree on the issues, even the ones where we think we're deeply divided. Yeah, yeah, and that to me that- And that's a shock. People say, oh my God, I didn't think Democrats, I thought Democrats thought this. Turns out they don't think that. I thought Republicans were horrible on this. Turns out they're actually quite reasonable on, on a whole host of issues. Yeah. Uh, so we've been kind of tricked by the media. Mm -hmm. We've been a little bit, I don't want to be too aggressive here, but we've kind of been lied to. Mm -hmm. Because if we just watch the social media feed, the algorithm is pumping us yeah. up with anger. Yeah. And if we just listen to partisan news, they're pumping us up with anger because yeah. it's good business. Yeah, absolutely. We're going to stay with this conversation with Tim Shriver because we're going to dive into this whole element that Tim's been alluding to. And that is the fact that maybe we're not divided Maybe we're just separated, and it's been self-separation that is the problem, driven by contempt. We're going to get to the dignity of it all coming up next. Stay with us. Welcome back to Sunday Edition. We're staying with our conversation with our special guest, Tim Shriver. And uh, Tim, we were talking just before the break about this whole idea of maybe we aren't so divided as a nation. Maybe we're just separated. And a lot of that is self-separation because we are looking at they, them, the other, the pejorative lace, right. the, you know, political commentary. So how do you see the Dignity Index helping people start moving beyond that separation so we can get back to that dignity, which ultimately leads to unity? Yeah. Well, one of the things that we've noticed, uh, Boyd, is that when people feel tense and angry and hostile towards other people, they stop listening. Uh, they can't listen. They're reacting. They're fighting back. You know, when you're in that debate and the person's saying, I think, you're already preparing your counter, right? You're actually not listening to the other person. What the Dignity Index shows you how to do a little bit is how to reduce the uh, stress and dysregulation that mm -hmm. comes with debate so that you listen. And it also gives you some tips as to how to listen, how to listen for understanding, mm -hmm. how to repeat back to someone. It sounds like you think mm -hmm. that the border should be this or the border should be that. And in that conversation, frequently, the, the fear and anger you had towards the other person will be mediated by a deeper understanding of their point of view. So all of a sudden, you don't necessarily agree. Democracy is not about we all think the same thing. Yeah. That's not the goal. 
And if it were the goal, we'd be foolish. The goal is not that we all think the same thing. The, the goal is that we have good debate mm. so that we get to the best understanding of what the best solution could be. Oh, you know, so, so people are, are starting to talk about this. So the Dignity Index can show you not how to agree, but how to listen with dignity, mm. and then maybe how to respond yeah. with your position, your policy, the outcomes, but not with your attack on the person. Yeah. I can say I think there should be a wall without attacking you, Boyd, mm. who thinks there should be open borders, or vice yeah. versa. Yeah, I think that's an important part of that. Oneness is not sameness, I think, yeah, is that's part right. of the equation there. Uh, and I think it's one of those things that uh, I don't expect this to come top down. I don't expect our political leaders uh, to drive this. I think this has to be one more example of community and culture leading, individual citizens leading, and the politicians will follow if we expect that. We, we tend to to uh, rate and score our politicians and elected yeah. officials on their issue, their ideas around taxes or border, health care, right. whatever it may be. We never score them on how they actually communicate. That's right. And that's one of our goals. Our goals is to be able to score in real time. Mm. And I do think we need politicians who are first movers on this. Yeah. And we have them. Yeah. We've, we've been working with uh, the governor here in Utah, Governor Spencer Cox, and many of his colleagues in states around the country who are saying, I'll try this. You know, we have a governor who's, uh, Governor Stitt in Oklahoma, who's made a new policy on his team. I'm a five and up. So if you look at the index, a five begins the process of treating the other person with dignity. He wants his public communication to always be at least at a five, mm -hmm. if not a six or a seven or an eight. Now, why is that important? You're right. We have to do this ourselves. We citizens have to own the change. If culture is broken, we have to own changing the culture. Mm -hmm. But it helps yeah. when we see leaders who are winning, who are succeeding, who are getting things done, and who are doing it with dignity. It starts to make it clear that this is not an inevitable. It's not inevitable yeah. that we hate each other. People, yeah. you know, we, we've pulled this, Boyd, and people are just, you know, they're so brokenhearted mm. about the country because they think it's inevitable that we're going to fall apart, that we can't get along, that we're so divided yeah. that we'll never work together. Yeah. It's not true. Yeah, it's, and you've been showcasing that around the country. You've been a part of some crucial conversations that have been demonstrating that, that opposition is pretty uncomplicated. You know, tearing and destroying things yeah. is undemanding. Uh, you're a part of a great conversation at the National Cathedral of all places. Uh, you had the... Uh, opportunity to follow Donna Brazil, which uh, right. I felt for you there. Uh, but it was an important conversation to say, look, we don't have to think the same, believe the same, live the same, but we can have a digni dignified conversation about things that matter to all of us. Exactly. And you had, uh, at, the, at the National Cathedral, you had Governor Spencer Cox, Republican from Utah, Governor Wes Moore, Democrat from Maryland, talking almost as though they were brothers. Mm. Now, there are some people who hear that and say, how could he? Yeah. That's outrageous. He talked to, uh, does he, doesn't he know what that other guy thinks? Do, how could he make, uh, uh, you know, uh, nice with someone who believes those things? Uh, that's the sentiment we want to ease out of. We want to get to the point, and most of us who come from faith traditions are taught to treat people with dignity. Most of us who have been involved in the American civic tradition Civic associations like Lions Clubs were taught to serve others regardless of their political yeah. background. It's deep in our DNA, but we kind of lost it. Yeah. Those events, like we had at the National Cathedral, Republicans and Democrats telling stories about their, about their lives and about their, where their positions come from. Uh, again, the goal is not agreement, but the goal is uh, decency, respect, and dignity. Yeah, that's how we elevate the conversation, get to a completely different space. Just yeah. in our last minute here, uh, Tim, you are an impact scholar up at the University of Utah. Tell us about some of the conversations you're having there. What are you seeing from those young students? I think they actually get this a little better than maybe some of the they, adults they, in the room. They really do. Republican and Democrat, progressive and conservative, the young people want a different future. They don't like what they're seeing in the country. And the, 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 the challenge we have is to use the best of scholars. Uh, political science scholars, speech and language educators, lo uh, legal scholars, medical scholars. There's a lot of talk in the academy about dignity, believe it or not. There's a lot of talk about the science of it for our relationships and for our culture. We want to bring that out to the world, to the world of politics, to the world of education, to the world of relationships, and help bring the best of the knowledge we have in the academy for an impact in our country.
Uh, so important. Tim Shriver, the Dignity Index, uh, an important part of the conversation, a crucial thing that we have to change in the country. And uh, as we've been talking, the change does begin with you, begins with me, begins with each one of us. And we're going to stay on this conversation. On Monday this past week, tens of millions of people looked skyward as an eclipse grabbed the attention of the world. We're going to talk about something that applies to all of this, the cosmic perspective and the principle it contains. It might surprise you. That's coming up next here on Sunday edition. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Sunday edition. On Monday this past week, tens of millions of people looked skyward as an eclipse grabbed the attention of the nation and the world. Many celestial seekers drove to remote locations to see the eclipse in totality. Sports stadiums filled with eager onlookers. Special watch parties and celebrations were held along with a myriad of eclipse-inspired weddings and countless online articles and news reports. The rarity of the eclipse caused and created a pause for many to actually look away from their digital devices and look heavenward and contemplate the vastness of space, the immensity of the universe, and our place in it. As human beings living on planet Earth, we've been long overdue for just such a moment of cosmic perspective. In the midst of a lot of political posturing, grandstanding, and an already contentious presidential election cycle, I thought I would revisit how would-be or should-be leaders might benefit from the contemplation and application of the cosmic perspective. My good friend and mentor Barry Packer popped into my office a few years ago and suggested that I should pick up a little book by Neil deGrasse Tyson titled Astrophysics for People in a Hurry. Now, I definitely qualified for the in a hurry portion of the program, though I wondered what in the world or what in the universe I would need the astrophysics part for. Little did I know that I was about to learn a priceless lesson. In the last chapter, DeGrasse Tyson delivers the powerful and surprising definition of the cosmic perspective. He simply writes, the cosmic perspective is humble. Humility as the essence of the cosmic perspective was perspective changing for me. Tyson makes a compelling case that once we recognize that we are not the center of the universe and realize how small we are in relationship to the immensity of planets, systems, and galaxies, our newfound humility will actually transform how we interact with our fellow travelers here on planet Earth. Recognizing our humble place in the universe would prevent us from falling into trifling arguments, social media tantrums, and resentment over trivial matters. Dr. David Bob, in his work, Humility, an unlikely biography of America's greatest virtue, writes, cocksure, supercilious, and narcissistic displays of arrogance abound in every arena of life, while acts of humility go unnoticed and unheralded. Our age of arrogance obscures the idea that humility is the indispensable virtue for the achievement of greatness. I love that. Arrogance is unteachable, intolerant, and often tyrannical. And those who possess it may amass power for a moment, but will never lead others to higher levels of living and success. Humility has reverence for new ideas and awe for the inspiration of others. It also understands that no one is irreplaceable. Those who actually possess humility are prone to carefully consider things they never had supposed while fostering the development of superior solutions along the way. The humility of the cosmic perspective is what transforms a manager into a leader, an instructor into a teacher, a politician into a statesman, and an acquaintance into a trusted friend. Dr. Bob went on to state, humility enables courage and points wisdom in the right direction. It is the backbone of temperance and makes love actually possible. You know, American history has been driven by such humble citizen servants who, while having passion, drive, and ambition, recognized their place in the universe and were willing to play their part in the miracle of it all. I once interviewed Mark Roosevelt, uh, president of St. John's College, a very different kind of college, this small liberal arts college with campuses in Annapolis, Maryland, and Santa Fe, New Mexico, maybe the best laboratory for not only wiping out the arrogance and instant certainty of our age, but advancing critical thinking, lifelong learning, and more meaningful dialogue. 
I asked Mark what was the highest and most important outcome he had for students graduating from St. John's College. Without hesitation, he replied, humility. I admit I was a bit surprised. Could humility really be the ultimate takeaway from four years of study? Well, after listening to Mark, I was reminded that learning can't take place without it, can't take place without humility. Neither can understanding, neither can compromise, and especially it can't uh, come to an element of compassion, which we all need today. St. John's College has no professors professing what they know. They have tutors and learners. There are no lectures. The tutors ask questions that lead learners on a journey. Not a journey to a predetermined destination, but to wherever the possibilities and principles take them. Humility is not only the antidote to the arrogance of our age, but the key to continuous learning and the path to true wisdom. Mark really got my attention during our interview when he said, we should all just take a moment to pause and shake our own zealotry. Zealotry is believing so strongly in something that you're completely intolerant of different beliefs or opinions. Mark continued, we should shake our belief that we've figured it out because we haven't, none of us have. And it's all very humbling to contemplate our purpose and progress. And maybe the next time we approach a controversial conversation, we'll be just a little more willing to listen and hear out what another person is saying, especially when they may be saying something we don't like. Well, I think it's time for America to return to humility and the myriad benefits that come with it. The humility to admit when we're wrong, to confess we don't have all the answers, to seek to understand those we disagree with, to ask for forgiveness, and to be willing to play our part in our families and communities. This cosmic perspective would forever change our world and the lives of the billions who live on it. Hopefully our focus on the cosmos this week will lead us to eclipse our arrogance with the cosmic perspective of humility and convince us of the need to apply this powerful principle, this cosmic principle of humility in every aspect of our lives. Well, that wraps it up for us on Sunday Edition Today. I'm Boyd Matheson. Thanks for joining us. And as always, as you go out into the world today, make sure you see something that inspires, say something that uplifts, and do something that makes a difference. Music and the Spoken Word is next.